Now, um, Matt's going to be uh, speaking to us a, a little bit later uh, today for the sermon slot, and he's asked me to um, read uh, this Bible reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this is verses 12 to 26. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which our, more, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. Morning, everyone. Uh, And again, welcome to the Sunday morning of MCC. Um, I'm Matt, in case you don't know me. Um, And uh, this morning, I'm going to be completing a four-part series we've been undertaking, uh, which has looked at relationships within the church body and how to strengthen them. Uh, hence it's titled Bodybuilding. Um, I was going to you know, be talking about how as brethren's wish to become more exclusive, but I guess after this morning, that's not going to fly anymore. <laughs> okay, uh, just to give you the heads up over the next couple of uh, weeks as far as sermons go, uh, as Alastair mentioned before, from next week, we're going to be embarking upon, I think, a, a, between a four and six part series on the Holy Spirit. So stay tuned for that. Um, and peppered amongst that, we'll also be finishing up our four part series Uh, on the book of Ruth. So that's where sermons are going uh, in the near-term future. Ruth and the Holy Spirit. This week, to kind of conclude this four-part bodybuilding series, I want to really hone in on how we can encourage each other's spiritual growth and maturity. Now, this talk won't be looking at the kind of obvious practical ways um, of doing that, things such as practical pastoral care, good deeds, stuff like that. Those are important but they won't be the focus of this talk. This is more about how we can directly help each other grow to be more Christ-like. And the context of this is going to be relationships. So the focus of the next 20 minutes or so is really going to be looking at relationships within a church. What do these relationships look like? I think you can see some common features amongst good inter-church relationships. First of all, they're going to be undertaken by people who know that they are broken and who love others unconditionally as a result. This is something that we've talked about in previous talks. And that's something, that that unconditional love that springs from a place of acknowledged brokenness that they can offer anyone in their community. But also on top of that, to a few people within that church community, they can, um, a few people that they're close to, they can offer something more. They can impart vision. They can impart vision. And I'll come back to explaining that term later. But basically, they can reflect back to people, people who they're close to within that church, what God may be doing in that person's life. So I'll be going through these two points in detail one at a time. So the first one, brokenness and unconditional love. Church is a place, and again, this is a common theme that's come up in the last couple of talks. Church is a place for people who have been disappointed. It's a place for people who know that disappointment is inevitable. And perhaps most profoundly, church is a place for people that recognise that disappointment is often actually for their good. 
Uh, Larry Crabb, who I've, whose work I've drawn on a lot for these talks, he's, he wrote that Christianity will bring us fulfillment, but first it's going to redefine what fulfillment looks like. And alongside that, Christianity promises happiness, but we won't find it travelling the route that we've laid out in our heads. Such good lines. Like we've already spoken about, other people let us down. We let ourselves down. Life lets us down. Our idols that we so often turn to for comfort, escape or fulfilment, they eventually always let us down. All along, God can use these, this, this, this stream of letdowns for our good. All along, he can lead us to more and more trust and finding satisf satisfaction and fulfilment in him and him alone. But the process along the way can be, as many of us know, just excruciating. So church, I think, on one level, is almost a, uh, a container. And I was trying to think, like, what's this like a suitable metaphor as far as containers go for church? And this is like the best one that I could kind of come up with. I was thinking, what's something that you pour pain and suffering into but springs up something beautiful and was either a compost bin or really good country music? And I figured I'd get less pushback on this one. So, uh, yeah, so church is a, is a, is, is a container of sorts because it helps us hold and make sense of this disappointment and the brokenness that can then ensue. And, and, you know, think about it. This is a critical difference between non and spiritual community. Spiritual community won't deny or demonise disappointment and brokenness. Non-spiritual community, I think a lot of the time, is likely trying to avoid that. And perhaps on top of that, it'll even guilt and shame people who experience disappointment, people who suffer it. They'll say it's your fault that you're suffering this, this uh, disappointment. Um, I, I can remember reading about a phenomenon that was fairly common in the big mega churches in the States and probably here too um, in Australia. Sorry, do you mind clicking that slide? Yeah, here we go. Um, and probably here too. So th this is how it went. Alre often already kind of successful people in the eyes of the world, say suburbanite professionals, they would join these churches when their children were young. And they saw these churches as being conducive to helping them meet their already established life goals. They're already determined roadmaps to success. For example, if I go to this church, then my kids will be instilled with good family values. I'll make some great social connections that I'll be able to network with. They'll be able to help me in my, in my kind of professional life. But once the kids have gotten older and then left, or perhaps that work promotion had been secured, that meant being incredibly busy, too busy for Sundays, or they just experienced unforeseen failure in their life, then these people would leave the church en masse. They were gone. Spiritual community was seen as a means to achieve an already established goal, to meet an already mapped out agenda, one that didn't include much disappointment, failure. And once that goal was met, or if a whole lot of disappointment had been experienced, then people were out of there. And I'd argue that's not true spiritual community, because that's not consistent with being broken and humble. The broken and humble have given up on their predetermined, defined script for a successful and happy life. Instead, they're concerned with holiness and trusting God. Can we have the next slide? Thanks. Ta. So, only broken people can really share spiritual community. And broken people are also capable of unconditional love. Because if I'm aware of my own brokenness and the extent of that, I'll likely realise that I can't go it alone anymore, that I need other people. I'll also know that I need God's mercy and unconditional love. So if I put those two things together, I'm going to be a lot more likely to offer other people around me that kind of unconditional love as well. Now, again, that kind of, that kind of unconditional love and regard, that's something most of us here are capable of offering each other. That's almost an environment, if you like, that we can cultivate. It's an attitude that we can project, or to pick up on Alice's term before, it's an atmosphere that we can help cultivate. We can kind of give off this vibe of all of us here are messed up on some level. And you, person on the street, visitor, you're welcome to join us along with all your particular messed upness. You're welcome here. That's the kind of environment that we try to offer. But it doesn't have to stop there. And here's where the, the vision imparting comes in. As we talked about last week, the, the fundamental reality of followers of Jesus 
is that they're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe. And that means, as we looked at, a new purity, a new identity, a new inclination, and a new source of empowerment. And members of a spiritual community care for each other by looking at each other with this conviction that because of all those things, God has placed something amazing in each of us. And though that amazing thing may be really well hidden, it may even be slumbering, it may be kind of uh, dormant and perhaps uh, asleep, it can be drawn out. It can be drawn out. And think about the difference between that perspective and that outside a spiritual community. It's understandable that when people outside a spiritual community look at me, they do a quick internal cost-benefit analysis in their head as to whether I'm worth investing in based on my past performance and history. So they'll be thinking about things such as where I sit on the hierarchy of winners and losers. They'll be, uh, their opinion will be taking into consideration whether I've hurt them in the past or maybe whether I've had repeated failures in my life. That kind of stuff will be going quickly through their heads when they're summing me up. They're going to be looking at my past patterns of behaviour in order to make a judgement on the present and likely future. Does that make sense? Well, that's understandable. Well, that's what we do. Usually history, past behaviour is the best predictor of the future. That's a solid, pragmatic way of assessing each other. But by contrast, hopefully my spiritual community will be starting from a completely different place. Hopefully, they'll believe that I'm indwelt by this supernatural engine that is slowly but surely empowering me to change. So instead of being hung up on the past or my many faults and foibles, they're actively looking for signs, any sign of new life. And they're encouraging that, they're celebrating that. So whilst not denying my many faults and screw ups, and whilst calling me out on those occasionally when needed, they are trying to mirror something back to me. They're reflecting back examples of Christ in me. And amongst my struggles and the feelings of failure that I carry around, they're pointing me, they're directing me to tangible, concrete examples of where they see God working in me. They want me to grow. They're expecting me to grow. They're letting me know when they see me grow and they're celebrating when I grow. So how can I not grow in a spiritual community like that? It should be a hothouse of growth, right, with people around me with that kind of attitude. And again, this isn't just celebrating things when things are going well. It's not just celebrating the good kind of regular victories of life. I got a job promotion. I finally managed to get out of the country and travel overseas again. It's just as much celebrating all the things, all the growth that can come through pain, through trials, through disappointment. It can be, I've seen God grow you through that messy relationship breakdown. I've seen you mature through that really tough bout of sickness. I've seen you just grow a little bit through the six times you've tried to get sober. You see what I mean? It's not just celebrating the good things, the standard victories. It's celebrating in each other um, the growth that God brings about through the hard time, through the suffering. And if I'm being loved unconditionally by people who I know recognise their own brokenness, and if I trust and believe that these people are looking out for signs of God working in me, if that's their focus then I'll be able to relax somewhat. I'll be able to be vulnerable in the midst of that community, to be honest. It'll feel, to use a phrase that still makes me shudder a little bit, like a true safe space. That's how it'll feel. That's how a spiritual community will feel. So what do we give to each other in spiritual community? Here's what um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about it. I'll read it out because that's probably a bit too small. So this is what he wrote, uh, again, way, way, way back in the 40s. Help must come from the outside. Help must come from the outside. God has willed that we should seek and find God's living word in the testimony of other Christians, in the mouths of human beings. Therefore, Christians need other Christians who speak God's word to them. They need them again and again when they become uncertain and disheartened because living by their own resources, they cannot help themselves without cheating themselves out of the truth. Listen to this. They need other Christians as bearers and proclaimers of the divine word of salvation. They need them solely for the sake of Jesus Christ. The Christ in their own hearts is weaker than the Christ in the word of other Christians. Their own hearts are uncertain. Those of their brothers and sisters are sure. At the same time, this also clarifies the goal of all Christian community 
is to encounter one another as bringers of the message of salvation. It's pretty profound. Huh? The Christ in their own hearts is weaker than the Christ in the word of other Christians. Their own hearts are uncertain. Those of their brothers and sisters are sure. Pretty striking words from Dietrich. And so similar to those words that we heard read out from Paul. What do we give each other in spiritual community? The word of salvation. Tangible, verbal reminders of the truth. Spoken reflections of reality. Amongst all the illusions and delusions being peddled by the world, in the midst of my muddled perceptions and feelings, my spiritual family grounds me in truth by reminding me of what that truth is. Now, I may think that I don't need you to do that, but like we've heard, Bonhoeffer and Paul would vehemently disagree. They'd say that that's just a delusion on my part. Paul says that the reality, the true reality, is that the different parts of the body need each other. We need each other. We suffer with each other. We help each other remain unified. Bonhoeffer, though not scripture, points out the reality that I often become uncertain of the truth in myself. And the best tonic is to have someone else who love, who I love and who I, and who I trust come alongside me and point out, again, remind me of what is real. And look, maybe you're like me. I can so easily just want to hear God's voice. God, give me a sign. Give, speak to me verbally. Reassure me that I'm on track and that you're still there. Give me a fleece to use some super spiritual language. But both Paul and Bonhoeffer seem to be saying, listen, the way that God usually, not exclusively, but usually works when it comes to reassurance and encouragement and strengthening and even getting through division and conflict, the way that God usually works is via run-of-the-mill flesh and blood. Relatively, the relatively unspectacular person who's probably sitting right next to you. But of course, despite us looking so underwhelming often to each other, we're actually not. Because we, the person sitting next to you, is spirit-filled too, is spirit-filled too. So the issue isn't God not working in powerful spirit-filled ways. The issue is that we are so often blind to those spirit-filled ways being via the people we can so usually take for granted, the people who make up our spiritual community. So we give each other this encouragement. We remind each other of the realities of our brokenness, the danger of idols and the love and the power of God. And again, here's a critical difference between spiritual and non-spiritual community. In spiritual community, the role that we play for each other is building up an awareness of God, an appreciation of Christ, and particularly the work of Christ in you, in each other. In non-spiritual community, often, the likely role would be building up our self-esteem or our value outside of Christ. Church isn't primarily about building up self-esteem in the regular sense. Because spiritual community doesn't put me or my self-esteem at the centre. Instead, spiritual community puts Christ preeminent in me and the call is for me to worship more. Does that make sense? That's a big difference. It's not just about making me feel good on my own merit. It's about pointing me to Christ, being the constant source of me constantly, reliably, always being able to feel good. Whoops. Um, so that's the, that's the imparting of vision. And I guess another way you could put it, a simpler way, is just encouragement. But I wanted to call it something different because I think that ideally, in this sense, it's not just general encouragement. It's not kind of generic encouragement. It's more personal and it's going to have a future focus. It's going to be a hopeful reminder of where God is taking each other personally. And that's going to be humbly given to someone in a tentative fashion, a tentative vision of what that developing new identity in Christ may look like in you individually. So... For example, this is the kind of dad that I see you turning into. Or perhaps this is the kind of mentor that you could be in the church, given where God has brought you. Or perhaps this difficult period of uncertainty you're experiencing is leading you to become more dependent upon God's grace and empathetic towards other people. And this kind of feedback, like it shouldn't be entered into lightly, right? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be kind of undertaken rashly, but it should still be offered. Usually, I'm guessing, in the context of a close relationship that you have. That's how it's going to come about, via people who really know you. So let's summarise what we've covered so far. Here's another way to try to snappily put all this together. Number one, the unconditional love. We accept you. We celebrate your purity in Christ as we worship God. So 
without that, without that acceptance, without that brokenness and that unconditional love, we won't have authentic, honest, safe community. And then there's the affirming of reality. We believe in you. We envision your identity in Christ and what you can become as we trust God. And then thirdly, the recognition. We see you and are glad to stay involved. And we can discern both your good passions, that, 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 that work of the Spirit, and we delight in them. And we also discern your bad passions and know that they don't define you critically. The bad things you do, the screw-ups, they don't define you. As we ourselves continue to grow in Christ. And then lastly, the giving. We give to you, so we apply no pressure to change you. As we talked about already, the power to change is already in you. And we give you what is most alive in us. Again, that imparting of vision of where we think God could be taking you and the encouragement that comes along with that. And that little summary to give credit where it's you is mostly Larry Crabb. Again, a great book, The Safest Place on Earth. So to conclude, all it, to conclude so where do we start? Like, where do we move from this kind of ideal to this uh, kind of ideal? Um, again, first of all, it's important to stress this can only come about in the context of relationships. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we can have both, uh, that we can have that kind of vision imparting relationship I described with everyone who's part of the church. That would be impossible. And it'd be impossible due to the level of time, honesty and intimacy that that kind of relationship involves. Those kind of relationships where you can encourage someone so kind of, I suppose, pertinently, they can only be had with a few. The most important thing, I think, is that each of us have at least one relationship of that calibre with someone else who is part of our church, or at least that kind of relationship is being actively developed. Like a good diagnostic question may be something like, is there one person, is there someone in your life who knows what the biggest struggle that you're dealing with is now? And could you say that of someone else in the church? Do you know, is there some one person within this community, you're aware of their hardest, most pertinent struggle at the moment? That's not a bad diagnostic question to see, you know, to try to gauge that kind of calibre of relationship. So those relationships will be few and far between, but we can all, again, generally offer that unconditional love born from brokenness to everyone here. We can make that commitment to try and view each other as being indwelt by the Spirit and do what we can to fan into flame any evidence of that new Spirit-filled life that we witness. And a good place to start is going to be just through prayer, doing the work of prayer and realising that it may feel like work to begin with. And alongside praying to, for the Spirit to turn us into these kind of people, it's worth remembering that growth, this kind of growth at its heart is still a mystery. So we need to be humble. But we can still put ourselves in the best position for God to work. We can be obedient and strive for holiness. But we also need to want it, or at least we need to want to want it. That's going to involve prayer as well. But it's also going to mean putting ourselves in situations where we're likely to have these kind of relationships. I'd be suggesting starting small and starting smart. It's going to take dedicated time and intent to foster these relationships. It's going to mean... Sorry, can we have the next slide? There we go. Thanks. It's going to mean putting stuff in our calendar and making the time to spend with people. Probably the, like the regular same small group of people, you know. And for men, there's that old, um, that old adage of needing somewhere to go, something to do, and someone to do it with. Guys generally connect shoulder to shoulder more than face to face. So again, let's just start small. Maybe it'll be a small group. Maybe it'll be a common interest. And even getting here on a Sunday morning regularly and hanging around afterwards is a solid start. And after that, perhaps you can move into something more intensive, like the life transformation groups or equivalent that we've talked about before. The important thing is just to start somewhere if you haven't started. And if you have already started, please continue. And to sum up the series, um, I think here's the, here's the bottom line. This isn't a bad summary. Oh, there we go. It's always, yeah. Again, I'd like to quote uh, Larry Crabb, who said it so well. Church is at once the safest place on earth and the place of the greatest danger. Church is at once the safest place on earth and the place of greatest danger. Um, he said it, it, always it almost always confronts us with the most troublesome fear, our gaping holes, and the substandard ways that we try to fill those holes. That's what church will do. 
and you put that alongside being constantly side by side with your uh, flawed fellow humans. Now, when God works through it, it's exquisite, and I really believe that. You won't find a comparable experience to a good church experience I'd humbly offer. Seriously, it's amazing. But then there's the inevitable frustration, disappointment, and pain. So what do we do in the face of that inevitable frustration, disappointment, and pain? Three options. Go mad. And you go mad by trying to make church or spiritual community perfect and completely satisfying. That's a fool's errand and a guaranteed path of disillusionment. So you can go the other way and go shallow. So church is too risky and too dangerous to go deep, so let's just back up to a lesser form of community with plenty of healthy distance. So you join the ranks of the lonely, the self-protective, and the not really known. And as a tangent, you know, I've been thinking about this. If other people don't know you, do you really know yourself? I'd argue that you're largely untested as a person. You're at risk of, uh, of self-delusion because you're largely still stuck in your head. You haven't encountered the grounding reality of you butting up against other people. So I'd say that's, that's a pretty unsatisfactory option as well, going shallow. So the third option is to go on. Stay involved with a few, just a few people, and don't give up. And when that, when that ache comes about that we're going to feel, that ache of living in amongst a not perfect community, then take that as evidence of a maturity. It's not a deficiency in us, it's actually evidence of maturity. Because instead of putting all our eggs in this basket of present community, it, we can use that as fuel. You know? it's, it's evidence of a desire for the perfect community that will come about one day in the fully realised kingdom of God. So use that as fuel, that dissatisfaction as fuel to stay the course. And I'd say this is, um, this is a noble endeavour. You know, it's, it's with our eyes open, answering a call to invest in a few other people, to know them, including their faults and their foibles, but to view them, to give to them, and to love them in such a way that they can become the people that God has designed them to be. And so sure, like, it's, it's risky. And there's no guarantee that it's going to go right. And if it goes wrong, it can go spectacularly wrong. But I still wonder if we often overplay the risks. Um, there was this really interesting podcast, I'll send the link through sometime soon, speaking of you know, Catholics. This podcast between Jordan B. Peterson, this is very, very recent, so not a Christian, but a guy who's sympathetic to Christianity, knows a lot about it, and Bishop Barron, uh, who's a bishop in America, uh, and a really good kind of, I guess, like evangelist. And Jordan Peterson, of all people, he said this to Bishop Barron, he said, he said, this is the church is letting people down. The church is letting people down. So Bishop Barron goes, how? And Jordan B. Peterson said, the church is letting people down not by asking too much of people, but by not asking enough of them. So this outsider of the church says, the church has lowered the bar. It's taken the adventure out of faith. It's taken something that changed the world and has domesticated it. In other words, people don't take the church seriously anymore, Jordan B. Peterson would say, because people within the church don't take it seriously anymore. And Bishop Barron agreed. He agreed. It's meant to be a risky, heroic adventure of serving each other, of living holy lives. And these guys, Barron and any regular Christian would argue that that's what we've been designed for. And the risk is that we sell it short and we underplay it. I mean, look at, look at Jesus. The, um, the calibre of love and self-sacrifice is demonstrated when he's on the cross. And again, this, this is a line that came from the podcast. It really struck me. He's on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. And then the next time he appears to his disciples, he's seeing the people that betrayed him, that were involved complicitly in his murder. And he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. The first thing that he says to them. And you can imagine what was going through their heads when they first encountered him, right? Um, and so Baron says... That's the zenith of love. We kill God and he still comes back and says, peace be with you. That's the calibre of love and self-sacrifice. So we are the chance as a church, even in these small ways of these relationships with each other, of modelling our lives on Jesus in some small way by entering into the suffering that's going to be involved with getting to know other people and love other people and redeeming it, trying to do what we can to redeem the inevitable suffering of life. And that redemption will come about partly 
by sacrificing ourselves. But again, we're designed for this. And with God's grace and power, people, including ourselves, can rise to this, I think. And surely, again, looking at the life of Christ, the perfect human, it's worth it. It's worth the risk. So let me pray. Father, um, I thank you for each other. Uh, I thank you for community as we've um, talked about and heard about so much this morning. I thank you for the opportunity that it offers us um, to love other people and to try to serve them um, and to sacrifice ourselves and to enter into the suffering that comes about with that in a way that's going to be redemptive. Um, I pray that through the power of your spirit and the, the support of each other that we will continually become more and more the people who you want us to be, both as, as, uh, as individuals but also as a, a church body here, one that's characterised by unity, by selfless sacrifice um, and by holiness and a life of worship. I pray that you'll make us a light, a beacon to a watching world and that through this witness people will be drawn to you and um, turn to love and follow you as a result. Amen.